This is the European front, once again being established in fire and blood, not only by the Americans and British, but by many allies in the fight against Axis aggression. This is the supreme test of allied spirit and of allied weapons. The world's greatest military undertaking is underway. Casualties in this mammoth operation in the subsequent drive inland may reach a dreadful toll. It's the official allied announcement that the invasion of Western Europe has begun, that D-Day is here, that H-Hour has struck. D-Day is here. H-Hour has struck 75 years ago today here on the shores of Normandy. American and Allied troops threw themselves into war, a battle against Nazi tyranny and to save the free world. They came from small towns in Kansas and from big cities like Brooklyn. They were boys, many of them leaving home for the first time to face down fascism and the evil of Hitler's war machine. Many would never return home, cut down by bullets on the beaches or in the skies overhead or in the fierce combat that followed. The, the bravery of these men buoyed back home by the United States of America. A society that was joined in a common cause, buying war bonds, women filling factories, a country that was keeping calm and carrying on. Today, here in France, we celebrate these heroes and honor their sacrifice on this day, D-Day, 75 years ago. And with us, joining us here, MSNBC contributor Mike Barnacle and columnist and associate editor for The Washington Post, David Ignatius, and in Washington, author and NBC News presidential historian, Michael Beschloss. The ceremony is moments away. President Trump will be speaking in just a few minutes from now before meeting with French President Macron in our seven o'clock hour. We're going to have live coverage from here in France throughout the morning. We'll be talking about this momentous day in history. What a remarkable day. And of course, we will be hearing from the president of the United States. Uh, but uh, Mike, let's first talk about uh, what an extraordinary place this is. What, what an extraordinary corner of the world this is. This patch of land uh, above the beaches of Normandy. You've been here now four times. And uh, I've been here a few times. I was talking to Chris Dickey, who was in tears as he left. Uh, we all are. There is nothing quite like Normandy. There isn't, Joe, and it's uh, <clears throat> overwhelming. It is extraordinary. It's humbling. Uh, and as you stroll across the immaculately kept grounds here and look at the individual crosses and stars of David and the splendid white behind us, and you look at the dates, and the, the dates, David and I were talking about this yesterday, the dates of death that really strike you are those who died on June 6th. Yeah. And you see person after person, man after man, from New York, as you just alluded to, from all over our country. And you can't help but thinking that USA, on these crosses and on these flags that flutter throughout Normandy, the American flag, USA, the first two letters, U.S., us. Mm -hmm. We did this in conjunction, of course, with the British and the French, but largely us, the United States of America, did this. What occurred here 75 years ago on this truly momentous day that brought the hope of freedom and liberation to the world, it was us. And, and David Ignatius, such an alliance to uh, the greatest armada ever launched. Of course, our troops stormed under the beaches of Omaha and Utah Beach. Uh, Canadians, Australians, allies uh, came in an hour later. But uh, we were talking before about uh, Rommel's defenses, the bullets uh, that were aimed in such a way that those young boys, uh, especially those coming up on bloody Omaha Beach, seem to be sitting targets. Now, as you stare, and, and you really, whether you're watching Band of Brothers or whether you're watching Saving Private Ryan, The Longest Day, there is no way until you look over those cliffs, as you were doing with Secretary of State Kerry earlier, that first of all, you understand how high those cliffs are. And secondly, the most daunting thing, how wide the beaches of Normandy are, several football fields at least. 
Joe, the reason this is a sacred place uh, for our country and really for the world is the bravery that it took individual Americans to scale that escarpment. Behind us, these crosses and stars of David are so orderly. Uh, they've been described as being like soldiers in formation. But there's such a contrast to the ca absolute chaos on the beach as those young men landed. They were uh, framed by German machine guns on Omaha Beach. There were 85 German machine gun nests ready to mow down those troops. The only way to survive, they realized, was to climb the escarpment. If they stayed on the beach, they would die. Mm. And they showed a level of commitment and bravery that is, to this day, extraordinary. It's why coming here, I think, matters so much to all of us. They came up that escarpment. They took their, their positions. By the end of that day, they had essentially achieved their objective. The Allies were in Europe. The war was on the way to ending. But it took those individual act, acts one by one, going up the escarpment, braving the bullets, leaving behind the comrade who died. Yeah. So it's, that's what this place is about. And Michael Beschloss, uh, it is hard for us to imagine 18, 19, 20-year-old boys running into that type of gunfire, uh, knowing that their death could be imminent. Uh, but you look at those individual acts that those heroes made on the morning of June the 6th, 1944, about 6 a.m., uh, fought till 11. Uh, in fact, General Bradley even talked about the possibility of retreating. They were getting cut down so badly on Omaha. But David Ignatius is right. By the end of the longest day, these young heroes, uh, and, and many of those that we honor behind us. Um, they actually had gained a foothold not only in Normandy, but in France within a year. The war would be over and Hitler would be dead. Absolutely, you know, it was, what, what really stands out is how biblical D-Day was. It was good versus evil, democratic ideals against dictatorship, you know, this stark moral clarity. And one of the things that you really get if you study not only D-Day, but the run up to, you know, the, the uh, soldiers marching to Berlin is that later on, military historians looked back on this and said one of the reasons the Allies won was because as people who had grown up in, in democracies, you know, Americans and Canadians and also British and others were able to make decisions on their own. The German soldiers who had grown up in a dictatorship could not do that, and that was something that turned out to be militarily extremely important. We want to bring in NBC News Chief Global Correspondent Bill Neely now. He's also here at the American Cemetery in Normandy, but from a different vantage point. And Bill, looking ahead at uh, what we're expecting today uh, during the ceremonies, the dynamics between uh, the leaders that will be joining here, and the remarks that President Trump will be making. Yes, Mika, I think uh, everyone will be listening very closely to what President Trump has to say. And just picking up from a point uh, that was just made a moment ago, you know, this isn't just a sacred place and a place of remembrance. It's a unifying place for Americans, whether you're Republican or Democrat or Independent. This is a place of unity, a place of common purpose. And the same goes for America and Europeans, British, French and German, at a time when there is disunity in the Western alliance, much of it, or some of it indeed, uh, by President Trump himself. It's also a place of moral certainties, of good over evil, of a unifying cause at a time when we really are struggling in a world of moral uncertainties and of disunity. So I think everyone will be looking to see and hear what President Trump has to say about the ties that bind us, about the unity between the United States and its allies in Europe, including, of course, Germany. And don't forget, Chancellor Angela Merkel is also uh, present at these ceremonies, marking the German dead of June 1944, not, not in any way uh, glorifying the Nazi regime, but, of course, 
uh, Germans died here too. So everyone will be listening to hear what President Trump has to say about NATO and how strongly he says it. Mm -hmm. Is he deeply committed to this alliance or not? Uh, he is a little bit late. Uh, he left, uh, well, whether he left the golf club in the west of Ireland late or not, we don't know, but the, it, we are behind schedule at the minute. And I think people here slightly worried also at his remarks this morning about China, about Mexico bashing Democrats. Perhaps this is not the day to do all that. Surely this is the day to remember and pay tribute and pay homage, uh, not just to the dead of uh, 75 years ago, but also to the, the veterans who are here in diminishing numbers, but they are here in their dozens right. and in their hundreds, and they too will be listening to what President Trump has to say. All right. Thank you so much, Thank Bill you. Neely. I'm so glad Bill brought up Angela Merkel. I will tell you something I noticed this year that I did not notice as much 15 years ago. Many more German voices. We were talking before about how uh, perhaps the strongest uh, uh, and the most adept German fighters were actually on the Eastern Front fighting Stalin. We had a lot of 15, 16, 17 year old boys, a lot of older uh, Germans here. But as we talk about what type of world these young men built and our leaders built, a world that's being debated now by many, not only in America, but across the West. You have to look at the irony that here we are talking about a bitter victory over Germany, and yet it is Angela Merkel who is standing mm. strong. For many of those Western values that George Marshall, uh, Harry Truman, uh, are, and our leaders after the war, the world that they built, David Ignatius, and not only are the Germans doing it now, but as the West Germans like to tell the United States during the Cold War, we are your most loyal allies. The sense that's the great triumph of World War II is that it led to a peace that has endured. It transformed a Germany that had been a menace in Europe uh, for several generations, a, a, an expansive, warlike Germany. That Germany now embraces the idea of being part of the European Union. This is, this is a peace that really transformed a continent that hadn't known peace. The end of World War I simply brought more chaos. It almost uh, uh, pre predicted uh, World War II. The young men who, who, whose graves are behind us probably were fighting to survive. They just wanted to go home. But the peace that they created with their bravery endures to this minute. Well, that's it. <clears throat> that's it. These headstones behind us are literally, it's no stretch of history, that these headstones behind us are the building blocks for the alliances that keep us safe today, that keep Europe safe today. They are the building blocks for the Berlin airlift, the creation of NATO, the creation of the common market, the growth of Great Britain and Germany, the reunification of Germany, the wall crumbling and Germany becoming one of our staunchest allies. They built that with their lives. And uh, Michael Bachelos, as again, the debate rages about the future of Western liberal democracy. Uh, it's hard not to look at what uh, the Allies did from 45 through 49 to create a world where actually you could have a Germany that would go from being a menace uh, to Western civilization of the world to being a leader of democracy, being a leader of industry. Uh, and again, it's, it's what so many young boys fought and died for in World War I and didn't get the result, but that's exactly the world that was created by D-Day and what followed. Joe, you were so right. You know, Dwight Eisenhower said uh, in 1945 that the test of whether the war in Europe succeeded would not be just, you know, victory in May of 1945. He said it would be 50 years later, and the question would be, is there a peaceful, democratic Germany? And if he were to come back today and see the record of Angela Merkel and what has happened in Germany since 1945, he would be absolutely cheered. I hope he'd feel that way 20 years from now. Tell me uh, some of, uh, we've talked about it off camera, but talk about some 
of the remarkable moments of early morning, uh, June 6th, 1944, when there was so much chaos. And yet, as Michael said, not only the American spirit, the Western spirit, going back to Greece and the March of 10,000, made them move forward up those cliffs. Multiple errors were made, Joe, uh, not intentionally, obviously. The intelligence was wrong. Uh, the intelligence they had indicated that there were going to be a uh, fairly poor level of German troops here defending the bluffs at Omaha Beach. Uh, the airborne assault by the United States Army Air Force, which is what it was then called, they were hindered because of the weather and the overcast, and instead of peppering the beach with bombs and exploding the mines that were already laid on the beach and taking care of the barbed wire that was already on the beach. They overshot the beach and bombed inland. Uh, the fields of fire, uh, General Gavin once told me that uh, Rommel's genius was never more evident than here at Omaha Beach where he created the crossing fields of fire and as you pointed, you pointed out earlier the, the length of the beach, right. the length of the beach, multiple football fields long it was literally a horseshoe shaped valley of death, it was a killing field. It was. Uh, we are waiting for the President of the United States who uh, not only is running late but is now doing an interview uh, with a Fox News host uh, while these uh, men in their 90s uh, wait for Four the heroes. president of the United States. They're David amazing. Ignatius, uh, there were errors, many errors that were made, but of course, if you're going to launch the largest armada ever, uh, not everything's going to go exactly right. But ingenuity and just grit got so many of those that, American heroes up that hill. We speak of the fog of war, the famous uh, phrase of Clausewitz. The fog of war uh, on D-Day that morning of June 6th literally was, was, a, was a dense overcast day with surf. Uh, it confounded our attempts to bomb these beaches, to take away the defenses. Uh, nothing went the way it was, it was planned for the most part. Churchill, the night before, as he launched this great army, said we have to assume that things go won't go the way we planned them. It was part of Churchill's wisdom to know that there would be mistakes. General Eisenhower, a, a man who at that point was smoking, if you can imagine this, 80 cigarettes a day. He was so tense. 80 cigarettes a day, just hoping and praying that this would, that this would go all right. Made the decision to go. Uh, I'll just close with a, a statement that, that Ike used to love to, to dis use to describe military genius. He was quoting Napoleon. And, and Napoleon said, military genius is the ability to do the average when everyone around you is going crazy. And Eisenhower <laughs> and our generals stayed calm as, as things went wrong. They just kept moving forward, move forward, up the escarpment behind us, onto this ground. And by, as you said, by the end of the day, uh, Omaha Beach in this area was in Allied hands. In fact, Mika, that's what Eisenhower's instructions to the troops were the mm -hmm. night before. He, of course, said the, the entire world's eyes would be upon them, warned them of how fierce the fighting would be. But his instruction to those troops, keep moving forward. And many of them had, uh, had no choice because moving back or staying in place um, would have it, it, we had they had chances of survival the ones on the front lines that were low <laughs> and yeah. staying still or moving back was not an option thanks for checking out msnbc on youtube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for morning joe and msnbc thanks so much for watching